I'm really honored to be here today to talk to you. Uh, we have a great international lineup. Uh, it was tremendous uh, lecturing today, and I am very happy that uh, I can talk to you. We've heard a lot today about uh, bone and soft tissue around and augmentation procedures around implants and the repair of defects. And I am proud to be the token lecturer speaking today about grafting around uh, the most periodontally compromised oldest implants you have, and those are your natural dentition, your teeth. So uh, I'm gonna be speaking to you about that and how that relates to post-COVID therapy and the importance of that during post-COVID uh, treatment. So a real do a quick disclosure here, the opinions are my own. Uh, I use multiple uh, slides and regenerative products in my office and um, anything I do say obviously is my own opinion. Uh, an honorarium has been provided by Geislake, but just like everyone else here, I am a clinician. I practice periodontics in New York City, New York. And since everybody was showing a slide of their hometown, I don't want to feel left out. This is uh, New York City, the heart of the US pandemic with COVID uh, considerations. And this is my building right here. This is the landmark building. So I've personally been affected by this. Um, we have been shut down and we're still shut down as of right now, only doing emergency treatment. So hopefully that will uh, pick up and end soon. I also am a clinical professor at Stony Brook um, and I do come across from a research perspective as well as a clinical perspective. I'm chief editor of the Perio Implant Advisory. I'm very proud of this journal. We have a lot of information here on periodontics, implants, implant complications, uh, socket grafting and extractions, a lot of the stuff that you've heard today. Uh, lately, our, unfortunately, our attention has been drawn to the COVID-19 problem. Uh, we have a lot of uh, information on that. And when we look at the COVID-19 phases, I really believe that we're gonna be in three phases. Uh, we're gonna be in phase one, phase two, and phase three. Now, most of us, or a lot of us, are still dealing with phase one. And phase one is the infection control phase, the financially securing your office phase. Th this is the gruesome phase, as I call it. And, you know, practicing dentistry right now is really about keeping your office safe, keeping your patients safe, keeping your staff safe, and financially keeping your office intact. Uh, that involves control systems, reduction of controls, reduction of transmission. We're questioning uh, if it's spatter at this point or aerosols that we have to worry about. Either way, uh, we do, and I'm sure a lot of us have had these uh, lectures ad infinitum about the inflammation and OSHA's controls of uh, substitution controls, engineering controls. We're all dealing with the PPE problem. If you haven't had quite enough of that, which I'm up to here with it, uh, you can go on my website, this Perio Implant Advisory, and I've given a webinar on this, all the system of controls that you need for your office to keep it safe. And we can talk all in all about untested material, uh, but that is not the purpose of this lecture. In addition, phase one deals with the financials, right? You have to keep your office moving. You may have been forced to shut down. Uh, you may have be coming out of it right now, but there has been a lot of talk about finances and loans uh, of that nature. Again, if you're still interested in this, uh, there is a nice article on um, that and the PPP as it relates to the Family Cares Act from uh, a CPA. So you can see that on the Perio Implant Advisory site as well. But more importantly, once we get out of that phase one, which is the hysterical phase, then we're going to get into phase two. And phase two is the active dental treatment. And some of us have been uh, out of the office for a period of time. Some of us are still out of the office uh, and some of us never left the office. But those who have been uh, forced to close your office to procedures are dealing with this if they're back in the office. And you're dealing with endodontic disease, restorative diseases. And in my case, I've been dealing with periodontal disease. And this makes sense, right? Because from a periodontal standpoint, we know that we're very important in terms of care under stressful situations and acute situations. And I really believe that there is going to be a big focus on periodontal treatment once we start practicing, once we're back in the swing of things. That makes sense from a biologic perspective, right? We're told from Goyal et al. that 
when we have stresses, which certainly we've been uh, um, forced with uh, forced and to deal with a lot of stresses these days, well, that leads to activation of the CNS. That whole hypothalamus pituitary adrenal cortex upregulates the cortisol, which leads to depressed immunity over time, especially in chronic release cases. And you get opportunistic infections. The IL-1, the IL-6, that all leads to periodontal disease. And I've certainly seen that in my office. Now, I've been treating emergencies during this crisis, and I've had a very controlled cases in patients who have been controlled for a long period of time develop refractory diseases and periodontal abscesses. Inflammation and disease uh, that normally that would have been controlled. Well, there's also a behavioral component and there's a behavioral mechanism, right? When people are stressed, things change. Their behavior changes. You, know, you, get, you get the comfort foods, you, you eat at night, you get the carbohydrates, you, you're in sweatpants, right? The, the, you're in sweatpants, you're not taking care of yourself. I've seen so many beards on the internet lately. Uh, that can lead to poor oral hygiene for your patients. And of course, the deleterious behavior, smoking, everybody's going to the liquor store. That's the only business that seems to not be affected. And, you know, drug habits. So again, upregulation of cortisol, bacteria involvement, and periodontal disease. And again, uh, you mix that whole bag, that biologic and behavior mechanisms, and you look at the studies by Spordoni and uh, Iacono, my mentor at Stony Brook et al., you see that bacteria recolonizes teeth after maintenance therapy in six to eight weeks. So you compound that with months of not treatment and you get disease, you get inflammation, you get bone degradation, you get tissue breakdown. And again, this is a patient who has been controlled in my office for a long period of time and has developed disease because of these uh, mechanisms that I've talked to you about. So certainly periodontists are gonna play a big role and treatment of diseased teeth are gonna play a big role in that phase two of treatment. I also believe periodontal treatment is going to be very important, financially speaking. And we know from the works by Roger Levin, who looked at lessons that we can learn from the 2000 economic crisis, that breakdown uh, because of the housing market, there were third party financing issues back then, right? Lenders were not lending the money for treatment plans that they were at the beginning of 2020 when we were rolling. Patients were on a limited budget back then. They only had discretionary funds to pay for essential services. And certainly cosmetic services took a hit and functional services of value increased. So if 2008 was any indication of where 2020 may be, or even worse, we know that periodontal procedures may play a very big role in treatment. And cosmetics may be secondary to catch up. Now, if you wanna read a nice article in this month's Dental Economics, Chris Salerno, the editor of, Dental, editor of Dental, Dental Economics and my colleague had a nice article about how lean dentistry can energize your practice. And he talks about how a lean dental office can really excel in these periods in time. And what you don't want to do is buy the cheapest materials. You know, uh, a, a lean dentistry doesn't mean you go down to the end of the corner, you buy hand sanitizer, a rip off K95 mask, N95 mask and, and some discount bone. You know, you still stick with the quality bone that like Geislick produces. That's not how you cut overhead. What he talks about in the article is managing supply, managing inventory properly. You don't want excess inventory and supply. And the way I manage in my inventory is I don't have to buy a ton of implant parts and componentry. I specialize in periodontics. So let me show you an example. This is a 25 year old uh, patient who came into my office as a, a referral from a GP uh, with a very big problem. She was in do-it-yourself orthodontics and we all know the problems with that. And sure enough, what happens, she develops a major 15 millimeter pocket around tooth number seven and eight. And I believe that is uh, 11 and 12 in the international terminology. Anyway, she has major problems. She has a one to two wall defects, zero wall defects in some cases, tooth number seven, eight, and nine, she was told that she has to lose and she was besides herself. Now, if, uh, Dr. Urban showed a nice uh, defects, anterior defects that he could graft, this would be very challenging if you take this out. And I think he even said in the beginning of his presentation that maxillary anterior augmentation is quite a challenge. Posterior mandible vertical augmentation is much more predictable. So in this case, it would be very unpredictable. Take these teeth out and do major reconstruction. You probably would wind up with some gingival ceramics. So she came to me and said, Dr. Fromm, can you think you can save this? 
I said, okay, let's try. Now we know we're in an uphill battle. If you look at the studies by Tenetti et al. 25 years ago, you see the remaining walls really predict how much regeneration you get with a capacity for regeneration. And you know, with a three wall defect, that's pretty predictable, you get a 95% chance. Well, with one wall, as in this case, not so well. It's about 39% chance. But can we try to save these people? Well, I wrote an article about this. If you want to read more about it, this is in uh, Dental Economics of 2019. It's saving teeth and changing the hopeless prognosis with new technology. And if you use the right tools, you can get a good result. So this, let's look at this case. This was, again, a very challenging case. This is tooth number seven or number 12 in international language. We opened up the, the area. It was a very a 15 millimeter pocket. We, used, we raised mucoperiosteal flaps and you can see a 10 millimeter intrabony defect. We cleaned this out with a 9.3 micron uh, CO2 laser. And again, this is the most important factor in trying to save teeth and regenerating these cases is complete defect resolution. Now you saw Dr. Rakuzo talk about decontaminating the implants. It is the same thing. You have to decontaminate the depth of the defect. And if you can't do that, you're not gonna be able to get good predictable regeneration, just like implant dentistry, okay? So you clean out the defect. You can see here a big, deep, uh, narrow defect. We use 24% EDTA, same thing as if you would when you treat implant complications. 7.4 pH, and we use some amelogenin, and then we have here a bioos collagen scaffolding matrix. Now, bioos collagen for me is my workhorse. It's a great scaffolding matrix. It's really moldable and malleable. It fits the defect really well. We use a bioactive LPR off, uh, soft tissue membrane here, and three months later, we get a nice uh, soft tissue result. 12 months later, Radiographically, it looks pretty good. It looks like we have some bone fill. Uh, we see nice soft tissue healing and we see about a 10 millimeter pocket defect reduction. Now, can I say this is regeneration? No, that's a histologic term and I would need to take a core for that. But lucky for you and me and posterity, she needed more grafting. So I was able to raise a mucoperiosteal flap again and do some re-entry. And you can see that looks like bone to me. Now, again, I can't say this is regeneration because I didn't do histology but that certainly felt like bone and probe like bone. So looks like we have a pretty good result here. She's happy, I'm happy, and the referral dentist is happy. And my inventory was a lot lower because I did not need all those parts and pieces to implant dentistry. So the second thing we wanna really consider in COVID-19 lean dentistry is conservative treatment with value, with value. So what does that mean? Well, I've seen a ton of webinars and I think one is going on concurrently talking about all on cases, right? We've heard a lot about this, taking out all the teeth, placing four to six implants, immediate provisionalization or immediate finalization. Uh, and to me, that seems pretty extreme. And this was one of the cases. It looks to me like we have pretty good periodontal support here, but nonetheless, all the teeth were dentulated and extracted. We placed four uh, implants and a uh, full prosthesis was placed by this um, lecturer. Now, is it valuable treatment? Maybe, but conservative? I think not. You know, I wrote an article on this back, uh, for, you know, almost five years ago now, and we talked about dollars and cents in saving teeth, and I compared regenerating defects as opposed to placing implants and possibly developing periimplantitis. And in every situation, saving teeth and regenerating the teeth was financially profitable for not only the dentist, but the patient, you know? When you get all that residual from the maintenance therapy and a happy patient, they refer five or six patients to you. So let me show you a case that was compromised. And back then, this was about you know, 13 years ago now, I wasn't confident about saving teeth. So the patient came to me with uh, a smile line that was pretty high and uh, endodontic therapy that had gone awry. Actually, I should say that she had uh, endodontic problems. This was a case where she had uh, restored her anterior teeth maybe four to five months before this, and every single tooth developed a problem. So she came to me asking me if I could save her teeth. Now back then, again, I wasn't uh, as confident, so I said, no, we're gonna have to take out six through 11, that's her, all of her six anterior teeth, and place implants. And she was besides herself. You know, here is a radiograph showing very big periodontal problems, restoratively open margins, endodontic 
lesions everywhere. And sure enough, I said it would be more predictable to take her teeth out. Again, I wasn't confident back then. So she convinced me to try to save her teeth. The first thing we did, obviously, was endodontic therapy. But you could see the uphill battle that I had. 15 millimeter probing depths, uh, inflammation everywhere. Again, we raised mucoperiosteal flaps. We cleaned the defect. Again, cleaning the defect is the number one um, determinant in success. And we had about seven millimeter infrabony defects here in this case. We used uh, that bioos collagen, that great scaffolding material, a xenogenic collagen membrane. Uh, just like Dr. Urban and Dr. Uh, Trolt showed you, securing that membrane is very, very important. It's the same as teeth. Securing that membrane, replacing the flap. We intentionally left the uh, membrane exposed in this case. We have good, thick, keratinized tissue. And here's our result 12 months later. We have a nice bone fill result, good endo. Uh, the margins on the new restorations are solid. Our periodontal treatment is only as good as our restorative care. And here is our case 13 years later. She's very happy. She referred four of her friends. And I would challenge anyone to say that they would get a better result with implant dentistry. Now, Dr. Calvallo showed, uh, De Silva showed you beautiful cases. But again, this is natural dentition 13 years later and stood the test of time. A very compromised case, perioendo involved. And 13 years later, we have a nice clinical result as well as radiographic stability. So are all of these cases long-term? I mean, I just showed you one of them. Are they long-term? What is the regenerative predictability of these cases over say a 10 year period? Well, let me show you another example. This is a 60 year old woman who comes to my office. She fell on the pavement. She uh, broke her front tooth. Uh, she has a periodontal abscess probing seven millimeters now. And she again is somebody who said, Dr. Frome, I want to save my teeth. Now this time I'm a little bit more confident. I say, absolutely. So we do mucoperiosteal releasing incisions. And you can see that not only do we have a vertical component here, but there's a three millimeter horizontal component as well. So we go to our regenerative bank. Again, low inventory. We use some uh, seven uh, to some 24% EDTA. We use some ameliogenin and our um, BioOS matrix. We use a uh, membrane for containment purposes. And we go through a series of temps. She's getting all of her anterior teeth restored. She wanted a cosmetic look as well. So we did some soft tissue work. And here is a day of our final insert. And she's very happy. You know, she's extremely thrilled. She got to save her teeth. She has a nice restorative result. Again, the dentist was very good about uh, the restorative margins. And here's our case 10 years later. Not too much tissue movement. So again, I would challenge anybody to say that a result with dental implants would look as good, if not better, in 10 years. So predictability and value. Now, you're saying to yourself, hmm, that's a pretty good result from, but how do they fare overall? And Cordellini and Tanetti did a study on this. They looked at survival over a 16-year period, and they found that we have a very high survival rate and long-term predictability when we're generating these procedures for natural dentition. 96% is very good. Now, I superimposed this study, and this was a study by Simmons et al. and Core of 2010, but if you look at the implant success rates, and that takes into account all technical complications, mechanical complications, biologic complications, you see that your results are not as good. You're in the 69% range. Now, Dr. Racuzo showed a study today, right? Treated periodontally, maintained person over 17 years, and he had breakdown. He, had, he didn't have breakdown on the, the natural teeth, he had breakdown on the implant. So teeth are terrific at maintaining the bone with good maintenance therapy and good oversight. Now you're saying, still, well, from in my hands, uh, this is going to be, uh, you know, a loss of tita titanium and sunshine all day long, I would place implants. Now my question to you would be, what would you do if this was your mouth? And TELUS et al. in the compendium of 2019 asked that question. They showed 100 dentists some radiographs of compromised teeth, pretty much what I showed you uh, during this presentation. And they asked, what would you do for your patient? Now, it's your patient. Would you extract and place implants or would you do endodontic and periodontal treatment? And of course, most of them said, I would extract and place implants because that's what we do these days. 
They then showed them a series of radiographs and they circled back to the same radiograph and said, what would you do if it was your tooth, if this was your mouth? And of course the answer changed. The dentists were more likely to be conservative and say that would be, they would do tooth saving procedures if it was their own mouths. So again, I would ask you, what would you do if this was your mouth? So that's really phase two of dentistry, taking care of the periodontics, taking care of the restorative. What do you think, what do we think about phase three? Where are we going with phase three of COVID therapy? Now, if you look at the risk factors for COVID and you look at what the uh, higher risk disease stratification is, you see age, you see hypertension, diabetes, obesity, respiratory diseases, inflammatory diseases. And these risk factors look very similar to periodontal disease, right? Same risk factors, some of the same inflammatory responses. And in fact, if you look at the pathogenesis of COVID-19, okay, when the SARS-CoV-2 virus enters the ACE2 uh, receptor, they enter the cell, and then they are uh, confronted with the immune system, a lot of the same host factors that determine what path the virus is gonna take and the disease is gonna take is the same as we see in periodontal disease, age, smoking, diabetes, inflammatory problems, right? They determine what kind of chemokines and interleukins are released. Now, if you have viral cl clearance, uh, you're gonna have the interferon, alpha, interferon gamma S, interferon alpha, beta, gamma, that thing where you get basically viral clearance. And if you have the IL-6s, IL TNF alphas, well, then you go towards that hyperinflammatory cytokine response. Well, that's the same as in periodontal disease, right? So we see the TNF alphas, the IL-1 betas, the same players that are upregulating the rank ligand and leading to periodontal tissue destruction is what we see in this uh, virus. In fact, a study just released last week looked at bacterial pneumonias and oral candidiasis as being somewhat related. So we see a lot of the oral diseases in the mouth have some type of influence over systemic diseases and especially pneumonias. So I think that a good way to go in phase three dentistry is to look at the overall wellness of the patient, patient as it relates to periodontal problems and implant problems. So that's why in my office, I started Scott from Dental Labs and we're testing the oral microbiome, the oral viral biome, serology testing, and we're starting to do nutrient testing, looking for things like say vitamin D. And I just wrote an article on that as well as Rick Marone wrote an article on that on how vitamin D plays a very important role in the wound healing response. So health-centered and science-based. Now, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this specifics. You know, I was only given 25 minutes, but if you're interested in this topic, as well as some of the other surgical slides that I showed you, we're having a wonderful symposium sponsored by Geislick in Texas, uh, October 23rd to 24th. All right, we're gonna be talking a lot about that. You can sign up at the perioimplantadvisory.com and our schedule is great. I mean, we have a lot of clinicians. We have Jen Dubrow talking about enhancing periodontal and regenerative outcomes. We have an endodontist talking about the importance of endodontic therapy as it relates to saving teeth. We have a um, Michelle Strange, who's talking a lot about infection control lately, but she's talking about new strategies in maintenance therapy, which is very important for uh, maintaining teeth. I'm gonna be talking to you about saving teeth versus placing implants. And uh, Kyle Summerford, who's the office manager at Kyle's Corner and coding with Kyle, he's gonna be talking to you about how to actually make uh, some money and financial a sense from saving teeth. So with that, uh, I will leave you with a quote and it's called competitive advantage in business. And certainly these days with patients have limited funds, uh, we're going to have to find out how to be competitive in this market. So Michael Porter from Porter's five force analysis, he's a professor at Harvard business school. He talked about how to have a competitive advantage in business. And he says that a business can be competitive and achieve competitive advantage over its rivals by two ways, cost and differentiation. Cost and differentiation. And he says, cost advantage is providing the same services as other businesses at a cheaper cost. This is when you buy the cheapest materials, you reduce your treatment fees, you run specials, things like that, to try to be, have a cost advantage over your competitor. And th this is not the model that I follow. He also says, on the other hand, you can have differentiation advantage. 
And that is when a business provides better service as compared to others. So this is when you can offer treatment in your office that others can't. And certainly saving teeth for me has caused my office to have a differentiation advantage. I've been able to save teeth when others have uh, steered patients towards dental implants. Now dental implants is a perfectly good option. However, some people wanna save their teeth and they wanna save their teeth even in these compromised cases like I showed you. So certainly differentiate advantage is uh, included in that periodontal therapy and saving compromised teeth. So with that, I thank you and I thank the program committee at Geislick for allowing me to speak amongst all of these well-renowned international lectures. And I, I think that at this time we have time for some questions and answers, right, Dr. Urban? Scott, thank you so much for, for the presentation. I really appreciate that, that the some periodont is still trying to save teeth. <laughs> and in fact, they are saving teeth. So uh, congratulations for that. Um, that's a, uh, you're, using, you, you're using the BIOS collagen. Do you, there was a question that, do you ever use amelogenin like on the roots first and then you apply BIOS or do you ever absolutely. use amelogenin? That's the question. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. You know, when you're, when you're trying to, um, you know, graft these very severe defects, the, the BIOS collagen is, uh, is a terrific scaffolding material, but what you really want to use is some type of uh, growth factor. So uh, whether you use ameliogenin or you use PDGF or you use the LPRF membrane, you really want something that's going to upregulate that TGF beta super cascade and lead to enhanced healing. So when you have these one, two wall defects, uh, I'm always using some type of growth factor as well as just the scaffolding material. Also, sometimes PDGF, for example. Absolutely, PDGF, um, uh, platelet derived growth factors, uh, enamel matrix derivative. Uh, again, I showed you, you a case with um, the LPRF membrane. Uh, that's good to use. Any anything that is is osteopromotive and cytoactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you know. Once we see, uh, you know, that that like Dr. Okudzo were able to, uh, he was able to. Um, you know, save some implants, you know, it's much more difficult to clean an implant. I think a tooth, you can at least clean it. You access, you clean the, the root, you have a very good chance to regenerate. So I also agree that there are too many teeth extracted. And um, I mean, that, that picture that you showed is, it, it's like, it, I hope it's a joke. It was not like a real extractions made on those. I mean, those teeth were, were basically maintainable for- Yeah, well, the, you know, the, it's funny. Dr. Urban, and uh, it, you know, people use the uh, justification that they're extracting teeth because they want to save the bone. I always hear that from my students, uh, from my colleagues. Well, I'm extracting the teeth because I'm saving the bone, and I don't want the bone to be lost in the future, and that makes my implant placement harder. And you know, I think we're putting the cart before the horse here, assuming that people are going to lose their teeth. And if you look at study after study. Um, you would see if you, you know, you would see that if you maintain the teeth, even if they're periodontally compromised, you don't lose the bone. You know, you won't lose the bone if you have periodontally maintained teeth. And uh, there's a lot of different studies that show that. Uh, so, you know, that is not a good justification for taking teeth out that you're trying to preserve bone. I'm sure you are, you're placing implants and, and that. What is your percentage of your implant practice versus perio? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not coming from somebody who doesn't place implants. My my office is about 50-50 right now. So we're mm -hmm. we're we're placing yeah, implants yeah. at a fifty percent rate and saving teeth at a fifty percent rate. Yeah, that, I think that's considered to be very high in the United States if you do fifty percent perio. Yeah. <laughs> Believe it or not, yep. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I in fact are <laughs> I'm referred some cases from other periodontists who haven't been trained to save teeth. And I, and I questioned, I said, aren't you a periodontist? And I don't know, I guess it's very popular in the programs now to, to, to place implants, but I think, and I hope to show people here that, uh, you know, and, and doc, like Dr. Rucuzo said, he said, I don't want anybody to be on the assumption that implants have a higher success rate than teeth. And I think that was brilliant. He's absolutely right. Especially in periodontal patients. In periodontal patients, his risk factor for periimplantitis is a history of periodontal disease. 
So, you know, I, I view teeth as more uh, that could, it could withstand this test of time longer than an implant can if it's not maintained. Another question, you know, uh, I know that in the United States, holographs are also very popular. Do you ever use them for periodontal regeneration, mix them? How do you choose or what do you, do you always use the bios collagen? You know, allografts are good to use. Um, it, you know, there, there's a thought there that, uh, you know, the, the uh, FDBA uh, has some BMP in it uh, that, you know, you have some type of uh, osteopromotive activity in the allograft. Uh, for me, um, my, my biggest, you know, and when I have a small defect, I will use that, uh, say like a, a three wall defect that just needs a little bit of scaffolding. I'll use that because it resorbs quicker. But when I have these large defects that need a scaffolding matrix for a period of time, say four to six months, uh, and, and like you showed in the posterior mandible, when you're, you really need that scaffold, you're using not only autogenous, but you're using the bioos because the bioos provides a scaffolding matrix and the autogenous is resorbing quicker. It's the same thing around teeth. If you have a very big defect, you want to use a good scaffolding matrix to hold up while you get that uh, ingrowth and the clot and all of that other, um, you know, regenerative cap capability. So the answer to your question is, yes, I use allograft in, in smaller defects, but when I have a large defect, just like you showed, when you have a large vertical ridge uh, challenge, you're using a good scaffolding matrix for, for building. Yeah, that's basically the reason why we're using it too. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Thank you.